Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk About Health. As Paul said, I'm Donna Jacobs, and I will moderate today's program. Let's Talk About Health is a community conversation produced by the University of Maryland Medical Systems Community Health and Outreach Teams. And again, we appreciate you being here today. Today's topic is lupus. And as many of you may know from attending previous sessions, there are several goals that we have with these conversations. They are to increase awareness about important health topics and issues that may impact our health and that of those in our community, to provide people with important information to help them improve and maintain good health, and lastly, but maybe not least, to improve communication between providers and patients. It can often be very daunting when you're talking to a provider and you're confronting a health crisis. So we want to help you through that. Here to talk to us today and to present is Dr. Jamal McDashi. Dr. McDashi is Associate Professor at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, and he's the Section Chief at the University of Maryland Midtown, Midtown Campus. He received his medical degree from American University in Beirut and completed a residency in internal medicine at Georgetown University and a fellowship in rheumatology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. His areas of special interest include systemic lupus, of course, and vasculitis. He's board certified in rheumatology and internal medicine. He's an expert, of course, in lupus and an expert in brain and mental disorders. We're really fortunate to have Dr. McDashi join us today. Let me reiterate a few things that were said a moment ago and a few things that you may want to keep in mind. Um, let's talk about health, albeit we are virtual, is intended to be participatory and, and uh, interactive. So please feel free to type any questions you may have at any point in the Q&A box, and I will try to pose as many of those as time allows to Dr. McDashi. He's happy to answer as many questions as possible, but of course he will not be able to address individual medical circumstances or provide medical advice. He can answer general questions. This webinar is being recorded, and I'll give you more information at the end on where and how you can see it again if you choose and have access to the slides. Next slide. We have cast, and again, you know this if you've seen prior webinars, we have cast these in the context of Ask Me Three. We think it's really important that all patients and families think about the following questions when you are talking to a medical provider. They really help you to get the information you need and to remember the in information you need in a circumstance that, again, can be very, very stressful. So there are three simple and easy questions. You might pose a, a fact scenario or describe symptoms that you're experiencing. You want to ask, what is my main problem? What's the problem? You then want to know, what do I need to do about it? And then you want to know, why is it important for me to do this? As we proceed, Dr. McDashi has a few questions that he'll pose, and I think you should keep these questions, these three questions in mind, and in order to be sure that you understand the information and if you have a similar circumstance or any circumstance, whether it's lupus or anything else, that you're able to pose these kinds of questions to get the information that you need. Okay, and with that, Dr. McDashi, thank you for being here, and I turn this over to you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure talking to lupus, particularly this month is the month of lupus. And uh, it, is a, it is important to be aware about lupus because there is a lot of research into the field and progress with no medication on board. Next slide. So what is lupus? Lupus is an autoimmune dis disease. It means that the immune system fight itself. The immune system job is to fight infection, but then it attacks our organs. It attacks the healthy tissue and then cause a chronic disease that is characterized by inflammation and pain in different parts of the body. Next. 
A patient come to me say, doctor, I have my joints that are in pain and are inflamed. Do I have lupus? Next slide. So I tell the patient, what is inflammation? I describe to them that inflammation is a reaction from an immune system that is that fight the body. The attacking the healthy tissue may end up in destruction of the bone, including joints, but it is come to us as swelling, redness, and pain. Next. For example, skin inflammation, you can see there is so much redness and irritation. That's part of lupus. Next. It attacked the skin and caused so much irritation and so much damage that we want to avoid this to spread to other organs of the body. A characteristic skin infection is called the malar rash or what we call the wolf disease. Next slide. These immune system, when they attack healthy tissue, they not only disturb the skin, but they go around the kidney, the lung, the heart, the brain, and the blood cells and cause damage. Next slide. But before we start talking about lupus and what it does, I want to advise you about the types of lupus. The most common that we see most of the time is systemic lupus. That's what we see in the acute care setting that is at the hospital, where the patient may have joint swelling, skin rashes, and leg swelling because of spilling of the protein. But there are certain patients who come in with only skin lupus, and that's what we call cutaneous lupus. Or those, some patients who come in that take some medicine that invite lupus if they have the gene for lupus. And then there is a neonatal lupus where we see lupus in the womb of the, of the pregnant woman, and that's called neonatal lupus because it's transmitting from those attacks of immune cells down to the baby. And yes, we need to be aware about these starts of lupus because treatment will differ among these entities. Next. A common question that I get encountered, my sister had bad lupus. Am I going to have lupus? Or my aunt, a family member, a cousin, a far cousin have lupus. Am I going to have lupus? Next slide. What we say, who are at risk of developing lupus? Women are at high risk to end up in lupus, particularly those women that are at age of 15 to 44, meaning pregnancy time um, and hormonal changes. Yes, it is common in African American, Native American, Hispanic, and Latino. But also if family member has lupus, then there is that gene, it may be circulating to the other siblings. Next slide. So what causes lupus? Lupus, we don't know the real answer to that, but we know it is coming from certain genes with certain immune dysregulation, but having an environmental trigger, it will invite lupus to come up. Next slide. Hormones, we talk about lupus in women, therefore we have to think about hormones, the messengers to the body, that they regulate certain organs and body function. Yes, 9 out of 10 are women when they show up to have lupus, and therefore estrogen is important to, uh, to look for as a triggering factor in lupus. But also, next slide. Hormones are important to, to, accept, to influence the severity of the disease and therefore a pregnant woman will have lupus to occur at the end of her pregnancy or after pregnancy. And therefore we look seriously about hormones in lupus. Next slide. There are more than 50 genes identified in lupus. But Having the gene does not mean that patients are going to have to develop lupus because what is important is environmental triggers that activate the gene. Next slide. 
these environmental factors, the most important is sun exposure. Next slide. Certain medication, if the patient come to us and they're taking even a medication for skin acne, they end up in some form of lupus. Sun exposure is important. The UV light exposure trigger and activate the gene. But any injury, any harm, any accident, any surgery will invite lupus to happen if there is that gene. More importantly, smoking is connected to lupus and to severe lupus. Next slide. I put in this because we asked, we had that question at many times, is that contagious? And the answer, it is not. You cannot catch lupus or give it to someone else. It's in your gene that is triggered by the environment. Next slide. So what are the symptoms of lupus? There are no early symptoms that are specific for lupus, but patients may show us to, with many various signs and symptoms that differ between person to person. A common theme among these uh, patients is fatigue, arthritis, and the rash that is called the butterfly rash. The way I want you to look at lupus is that it make your body sensitive and it is like a butterfly that hit this organ and that skin and that kidney and that is what lupus is about. Next slide. Lupus to us is important because it's not only affecting the skin, joints and fatigue and pain, but also it may spread to the kidneys, the heart, the brain and the lung and the eyes. And really we need to prevent that damage. Next. Lupus may come in as a fever. Yes, we need to make sure there is no infection. It may come in with fatigue, chest pain, joint pain, cold sores in the mouth, weight loss, and it has many other symptoms that showed up. And therefore, we like you not to ignore these symptoms, but to talk to your doctor about it. Next. If I have these symptoms, do I mean that I'm having lupus? Well, I told you about these symptoms of fatigue, rashes, and joint body pain. These are what we call nonspecific symptoms that may occur in patients who have thyroid disorder or certain other forms of arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis. And therefore, being aware of this entity, it is important to talk to your primary care provider who will do certain tests and then seek more attention with a lupus specialist or not. Yes, we need to get to see you early in the game if there is concern about lupus. Next. When I see a patient with concern about lupus, I'm looking for certain clinical and specific features of lupus, meaning cold sores in the mouth. They don't have to be at that spot, but I ask the patient, have you ever had any of those syndromes? I ask them for chest pain and difficulty with breathing, any spitting of blood, any leg swelling, any spinning of protein, any heart condition, irregular heart rhythm, some abdominal pain that are recurrent, and these patients will end up in inflammation and they have no etiology for it. Hair loss, uh, skin rashes, changes in the color of the hand, and many other symptoms. Next. And therefore, what I tell the patients, well, you may have some symptoms that are suggestive of lupus, but I need to confirm the diagnosis clinically and also by ordering some other tests, including blood tests, a sonogram to the heart, x-ray, and urine testing. Next. The most common blood test that is there is called ANA, the anti-nuclear antibody, which is a, an antibody that is attacking the blood cell of the neutrophil cells of the blood and that is called ANA. However, this test, a positive test, does not indicate lupus but it is an indication that yes, I need to think about lupus in that setting. And therefore, a common theme that a primary care provider sent us a patient to have joint pain and fatigue and having a positive ANA, we tell them 
you have the ticket into the world of lupus, but not necessarily yet. Next. And therefore, I will add more specific tests, blood tests for lupus. Next. And even I will order more tests, but also these blood tests, they may not be positive at that point of time. And then I, therefore I have to repeat this test frequently at a range of around every three months or when there is more trouble happening. Next slide. At times we do a skin biopsy or a kidney biopsy to require to diagnose lupus. A patient may have a kidney biopsy that's positive lupus with lupus with no blood testing. We will say yes, definitely. That's, that's really specific for lupus, similarly to skin spots of lupus. Next. There are more than nine celebrities have lupus. And yes, lupus awareness had been there. And yes, we feel with these celebrities. But what I want to say, every patient that I see with lupus is celebrity to me. Next slide. If I diagnose you or have a diagnosis of lupus, what to do about it? Can anything be done to slow the process? What we tell you nowadays is early diagnosis, meaning you talk to your doctor about the diagnosis, is important. It's important to avoid the triggers that activate the, the lupus flare, and excessive exposure to the sun is one of them, and therefore sun protection is important. Again, we advise you about certain medicine to avoid, but if they are needed, we are okay with that. And therefore, we have to target the treatment early in the game to prevent damage from occurring, meaning kidney uh, loss of kidney function and uh, severe lung disease or heart disease. Next. We are lucky to have a lot of blood testing to diagnose lupus more into this field is under research. And even we have uh, genetic testing to identify if the patient is flaring or not. Yes, these are under research, but there is an ongoing um, attempt to deal with this diagnostically without a skin biopsy or a kidney biopsy. Next slide. Again, how we treat these patients with lupus? We advise you what we call non-pharmacological treatment. That include avoiding sun exposure. Yes, I want to enjoy being at the beach, but I will wear long sleeves. I wear a hat. And we advise you about vaccination because some of those vaccinations, while they're important, they may invite um, lupus as well. Talking with your doctor about the benefit and the risk of vaccine is important. Certain diets may trigger also um, um, activation of lupus. Fish oil is one of those that help as well. Stress is the enemy of lupus. And I'm talking here about emotional and physical stress, but as well smoking. It is an important factor in activating the gene of lupus, but also in worsening the clinical syndrome of lupus. Next slide. Many treatments are available. In 1950s, they were the antimalarials and the steroids. Today, in the 21st century, we want to avoid steroids in patients with lupus. We have some, so many alternative immune therapy that are new and novel, and therefore they are being used as well as biological treatment. Next slide. Many new are already FDA approved, but many are in the pipelines and there is a lot of research into this field. Luckily, we have been able to target and hit and understand more about lupus so we can do new lupus treatment. Next slide. I don't want to end up, as I said, celebrities, they have the money. These medicines are expensive. They are in the range of fifty to eighty thousand to one hundred thousand dollars. I want to get this to every patient. We need to talk to everyone to make these accessible, but also I want the patient to come to us as early as possible and be treated like a celebrity. Next slide. 
There are many challenges that are there in lupus research. We need to find a better biomarker, an indicator of lupus, an early diagnosis, access to a care. We measure a zip code to the University of Maryland, how far the patient live away from University of Maryland to get lupus care. We deal with Baltimore because Baltimore has a lot of lupus in its neighborhood. We need to educate our patient, the young patient, the one that they will say, I don't want to deal with a chronic disease. These are challenging issues, and I need to work with our community to help get these patients to us, particularly if there is a flare or the doctor is not responding. But also, I want to avoid the use of steroids because it's an easy task to give at the emergency room. Uh, because that also may contribute to damage. Next slide. These are some of the challenges that I will put in it for the future of lupus. I want to prevent the disease from happening by early detection. I want to protect the patient from having complication of lupus, including infection. I want to prevent damage that attack the heart or come in with a stroke later in time. And therefore, there is a lot to work in dealing with lupus. Next slide. My important facts and lesson to you is lupus has many faces. It comes to us in many types and many clinical syndromes. We call it the 1,000 faces of lupus. That's make it difficult for us how we diagnose lupus. So we ask you to bear with us as we wait for this blood test to confirm lupus, but also for diagnostic testing to be important, more research is needed, but also seeking attention with a specialist or your primary care provider is important to deal with these autoimmune disorders. Next slide. I wanna thank my patients who taught me about lupus. It's not about my training, that get me into lupus, but it's the mother of a lupus patient who come to me and say, she's not telling you about this, she's not telling you about this. A 60-year-old patient come with her mother to us because of caring, and that I want to appreciate the mothers uh, that come to us with their kids, and they really um, help us in dealing with these lupus uh, difficult patients. And I want to thank you, and I will respond to your questions. This is a checklist done by the Lupus Foundation. Uh, you can, as I said, look at it, and as I said, share it with your primary care provider if you have some of those symptoms. Okay, very informative, thank you. We do have a few questions, and I want to remind our listeners that if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the Q&A box, and Dr. McDashi will be happy to answer as many as we can get to. Today, So I'll start. There are two related questions, Dr. McDashi, that I, I think they're related, and I will pose them both at the same time. One is more general, which is, is there a cure for lupus? That's one. But the one that's a little bit more specific, you mentioned drug-induced lupus. So the question is, if you are taking a medication that induces lupus, does the lupus go away? if the medication is discontinued? Yes. So I'll answer the second question. Um, uh, a drug-induced process, drug-induced lupus, um, is an entity where we say the patient had the gene for lupus and they take some medicine, which is a simple antibiotic that's used for acne. Then patient come in with a skin of lupus. If they stop the medicine, then the lupus symptoms go away. It may take around um, six months for the blood test to go away, and it may take around a year for it to go completely. But I want to advise you that these medicine, when they come to be attacking the system, that means there is a gene that's active, being activated by this medicine. So a drug-induced lupus, a drug-induced blood test of lupus, is there, but we keep an eye making sure that there is more than a drug-induced lupus. These types of lupus 
they just overlap, meaning a skin of lupus may occur in patients who have systemic lupus. This question is about do patients who are taking specific medicine are at harm of taking the medicine? And the answer is there is no major harm. But working with your primary care provider and the lupus specialist will see the benefit and the risk of this medicine and then we can they can be discussed as that. So I told you, yes, these symptoms will go away if it's a drug-induced lupus as well as the blood test that may take some time. Is there a cure for lupus? That's an ambitious item that's on the agenda of lupus experts. We want to cure lupus like what we are doing with curing cancer. At this time, we're telling you a better understanding of what bring in lupus and what are the genes that are related to lupus. Yes, with the new medication, we can beat lupus. And that's what I will tell my young patients that yes, if you work with a lupus specialist, we can help you get out of this and keep that lupus quiet. We cannot change your gene, but we can keep it quiet at this time. Let me ask a follow-up question about the medications that may activate the gene. Is there somewhere where there's a list of such, a universal list of such medications so people know to look out for a lupus? Yes. The, the list is available, but what we tell other doctors is any medication can be incriminated in lupus occurrence. So the list is larger and larger, but yet there are specific lupus that are specific medicine that invite lupus and they are well described, in, as I said, all across the Lupus Foundation as well website. But yes, this list is available. All right, and I, you, you mentioned earlier to me the Lupus Foundation, so I would just like to note for our listeners that the Lupus Foundation website is a place, a font of great information if you want more after today's. Yes, and website. please use my name when you're talking to the Lupus Foundation and they recognize me, and as I said, they will be helpful. Oh, that's great. Thank you. All right, here's a, there are many questions coming in now. What is the difference between lupus and rheumatoid arthritis? Excellent question. One third of patients who come to us with lupus diagnosis have arthritis as their initial feature. However, rheumatoid arthritis is a crippling form of arthritis. It will affect both hands, both shoulders, both knees, both ankles. In patients with lupus may have a rheumatoid-like, meaning there is no destruction, but yet there is pain and swelling in that joint. Both are autoimmune disorders, and the blood testing will differentiate between these two. Very good. You spoke about environmental factors, stress as well, that are triggers. Someone is asking, how does alcohol, if at all, affect lupus? Yes, there are a lot of studies into alcohol intake as well in inducing lupus. But when we say alcohol, I'm talking about bench drinking. These are patients who like, really they have problem with drinking and they end up in activation of the immune system as well. So any factors, including smoking as higher on the list, but then alcohol is a weaker link there. But binge drinking may invite lupus and cause damage as well. Okay, so vaccines are something we're all thinking about a lot these last few years. Question here says, which vaccines are associated with lupus? Correct. All vaccines can activate the immune system. Remember, I told you about lupus is an immune dysregulator. And what these vaccines, it's invite this dysregulation. However, it's important to note the benefit of vaccines. The benefit of vaccine is there and therefore we want, before we start our immune therapy, because they weaken your immune system and they will invite infection. So we encourage you to talk with your doctor about the vaccines. What your doctor talked to us about it, about the timing of vaccination. It is important that we talk about it, like when the patient is taking prednisone, we do not want you to take vaccines because that, again, it invites complication. And therefore, discussing this 
option of vaccination to prevent infection and complication that show up in lupus is important, but also the benefit of vaccine need to be discussed. And I'm talking here about all types of vaccines that are there. The American College of Rheumatology came up with a vaccination uh, agenda for patients with lupus. Discussing this with your primary care provider and your lupus doctor will help you navigate this challenge. Can you help clarify? So is lupus only present if the gene is activated? You must have the gene in order to have lupus? So lupus has many genes. It's what we call polygenic. But the environmental factor trigger that gene, mm -hmm. similar to cancer. Many patients have that gene. We don't have to react to it and then do, hey, am I going to die from cancer or not? What we are saying is it's an interplay between gene, environment, and other factors that are there that can invite the lupus disease. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if the gene studies have told us twins, one may have lupus, the other may not have lupus. Again, it is the environmental trigger that invite that activation of that gene. But also, if patients have lupus, we are advising them to slow down on stress because that will trigger flare and bring in more damage. And therefore, chronic stressors and major stressors invite lupus. I'm talking here about PTSD, but also chronic stressors, stressors of every day, driving to your work may be a stress. Um, challenges at the job bring in stress. All of this invite challenges in dealing with lupus in that setting. I don't say, I did not say that lupus is a stress disorder. I'm saying stress manipulate the immune dysregulation that's already been challenged in lupus. Got it. All right. My daughter is getting labs done today. At what point should she go to a rheumatologist after the blood work for a more in-depth diagnosis? And how difficult is it to get an appointment? And where should she seek an appointment? So the key, the key about it, what we want about doing the blood test, there is a cost um, effect to this blood testing. The lupus testing costs around $800. That is the specific test on a general lab, lab testing. And therefore, we have to have a screening tool, meaning if your doctor is suspicious clinically of certain forms of lupus, then they do the preliminary test, and then the secondary test will follow. Therefore, we do not want to screen for lupus because the blood test does not tell us unless there is a clinical syndrome. We want to advise not to abuse laboratory testing in that setting. We advise you not to have blood testing routinely for lupus unless there are some clinical features that are suggestive of lupus, then we can do that connection between the blood test and the clinical syndrome. You mentioned earlier um, some of the tests, as we're talking about now, for lupus, and one was biopsy. Didn't say a lot about it. Someone is asking, how is a kidney biopsy performed? Yes, it's a simple uh, test. It's an invasive procedure. It, it's important to get a kidney biopsy because it will give us information how much is the inflammation, but how much the kidney is viable, meaning there is how much scarring that is there. We have repeated skin, uh, kidney biopsy on many patients, meaning we have to see how much it is reacting or if there is a change in the behavior. Because lupus, as I told you, is a butterfly that hit and run. It's just hit you there and then just go quiet, but then come back and hit you in a different angle, even within one organ like the kidney. And therefore, to better know more about what's happening, we seek attention to the biopsy. But also, our goal in patients dealing with kidney disease, particularly in Baltimore City, those are inner city neighborhood of University of Maryland, high risk to end up in kidney disease. 
by within 10 year period, patient will end up on dialysis after the diagnosis of lupus. I need to avoid that with whatever means and tools I need to. That means I need to control their blood pressure and their blood sugar because that also can worsen the kidney function. And therefore, yes, I may need to get access to a kidney biopsy. But we can manage if the patient prefer not to have an invasive procedure to deal with that entity. You know, let me just note for our listeners, a month ago, I think it was, we did a session on chronic kidney disease and real discussion about the prevalence of kidney disease and how many people don't know that they may have it. So something that people may want to look to, and I will share information on how to get that and see that if you like. All right, I have a, a clarifying question here. Someone says, I want to make sure I got this right. I think I heard you say that you don't necessarily take one negative test, like a negative ANA blood test, as a perfect rule out for lupus or another inflammatory disorder. And I also heard you say maybe you want to retest. How many times do you suggest that I do that? In my experience, I only can get my doctor to retest or do more when I specifically ask or advocate for something specific. So any guidance you can offer would be helpful. Sure. You mentioned the word advocate, and I will say, I want my lupus patient to be advocate for their health care. We want to empower our patient to talk with the doctor, and they should respond to the needs. The key about it, what the Lupus Foundation, the lupus researcher will say, at any point of time, if there is a positive blood test for lupus at high titer, that will put you at risk for lupus. And therefore, if there are clinical syndromes, that show up here and there are specific for lupus, then yes, we will take that into consideration. The key about it, what does the negative blood test tell us at the beginning? If it's negative, it indicates to us that yes, you're not going to end up in kidney disease or have failure in the lung or blindness or a stroke. It tells us that your lupus is, is, is mainly like you have the gene for lupus, but you have another gene that's protecting you from having that lupus. And therefore, depending on your symptoms, will target how the thing's about. Meaning, if there is kidney irritation with its symptoms of, to suggest lupus, but negative testing, that's what the time when we do a kidney biopsy to confirm if it's lupus or not. So having blood tests repeated is not going to be helpful because we're not dealing with the, bio, with the blood test, we're dealing with you as a patient about your symptoms. So targeting your symptoms and dealing with it is more important than getting that lupus diagnosis because it will show up at any point of time. Great. Thank you. Therefore, what you hear from research about incomplete lupus or like um, lupus-like illness, um, uh, the drug-induced lupus and things like that. So, so Yes, we want to educate the primary care provider about these entities, but until we have a better tool of diagnosing, diagnosing lupus, that remains a challenge. You spoke about lupus hitting young people and especially women. Here's a question. My 17-year-old daughter was diagnosed with linear cutaneous lupus. Can it turn into SLE? What do you suggest for a teenager who is newly diagnosed with diagnosed with lupus, and of course, a bit stressed about her diagnosis. This is our major challenge. These are young women. Lupus can occur at the age of six months. I told you about neonatal lupus as well. And therefore, for young women that we see them in Baltimore, that's the time there is hormonal changes. This is the time that lupus comes in. We tell them, this is a chronic disease, you have to be a friend with me or with a lupus specialist or your provider. We can deal with it and then we prevent it from spreading to other parts of your body. We do the blood testing and it indicate if you have a risk to end up in kidney disease or systemic lupus at that entity. Yes, we need to work with our uh, collaborators, meaning the dermatologist if it's in the skin disease. And dealing with that with new medication are now, particularly for skin disease, are more helpful. Therefore, I want to advise our young women, 
having lupus is not bad. We can deal with it together. But you have to come to us and talk to you about it. It's your health, but we have the tool how to manage it. It's important to do this message in the community and at charge. Lupus in the past was connected with death, not anymore. Where patients are surviving till 90s and 100 with lupus. We want to get that message if we have a better tooling with early diagnosis and access to the, to the lupus specialist. We are open to you. At the University of Maryland, we created a lupus clinic. And there are many sites, but reach out to the doctor to talk to you about lupus because it's changing. A lot of research and a lot of um, um, new medication are coming out. Young woman, we can deal with lupus. We want you to live normal. We want you to have children. We will go through this together. Even if it's complicated, we can manage it. It's my job to help you. That's our goal at the University of Maryland. That's such encouraging information and so important for a community. Okay, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce this drug properly, but can the, can the osteoporosis medication Fosamax, Fosmax contribute to increased joint swelling and pain in a lupus patient? Any medication, as I said, can be incriminated in worsening clinical syndrome of lupus. Dealing with, with the benefit of that medicine and saving lives is important. Fosomax is introduced to save fracture from osteoporosis, a common problem in young lupus patients. However, when patients take Fosomax for long term, greater than five years, they end up in necrosis of the bone, a common feature that happens in lupus. And therefore, we have to talk to our young women about this medicine. We collaborate with our endocrinologists to tell us more about the bone health of those patients. We look for these conditions. We look for how thin is the bone. Are they taking their vitamin D on both of that? And we avoid medicine that may be taken for long term because we have many alternative treatment are there. We challenge the insurance to help our patients. Even Fosamax, a cheap medicine at this time, but many alternative medicine are available. And there is an osteoporosis center at university with Dr. Whitlash and others at the endocrinology division that can deal with bone health. And we collaborate with them in that setting. Similarly, pain, kidney disease, nephrology, we collaborate. We want to make it an effort in lupus to have not only the patient alone or with the primary care provider, but a lupus specialist, the kidney, uh, with, uh, the kidney specialist, the endocrinologist, the bone uh, specialist, the pain specialist, all are, should work as a team for our patients. That's how we save lupus patients. Dr. McDashi, we have about 10 more questions. I'm going to try to see if we can zoom through these and and stop at those, um, if you all will. Let's see if we can make it. Also, someone's asking, what is considered a live immunopressant, immunosuppressant vaccination? So a live immuno, like one of those um, medication is like polio. It is attenuated. We don't want to give it to patient who's taken too much prednisone because it may invite polio. Like the other vaccines are like shingles. There is Shingrex, so there are many advanced um, uh, vaccines that are there and that they are important and safer. And therefore, live vaccine is not is not is important to avoid in lupus patients. Got it. Okay, I I was wondering about this one. If pregnancy induced lupus runs in a family, what should a person do before considering having a child? And then to follow on that. Does the gene transmit in utero or do you transmit lupus if the mom has it? How does that work? Good, great question. Our job is to educate our young women to have a healthy life, including the stress of pregnancy. Thanks God, during pregnancy, the system goes down, meaning the inflammation goes down because they want to protect the foreign body, which is the baby. 
but then the baby need to get out and the body will tell you, I don't need, I need to regulate my system back again. And therefore I may become active. I want to get rid of the baby. That's the time when we got busy with lupus at that time. And therefore sitting down with your lupus specialist and your primary family medicine care provider, planning ahead the timing of pregnancy, the timing of conceiving, what medicine is right during pregnancy, and we can flow through that. We have a high-risk pregnancy uh, team at University of Maryland and at Hopkins. They can help us run this pregnancy smoothly, and we will do it. Great. What's the best biologic to treat lupus systems right now? There is no biologic and specific treatment. The treatment guidelines for lupus are there, are being cooked at this phase. But yet we are talking about certain medication, including hydroxychloroquine, the plaquenil, as your primary anchor medicine. And then we escalate therapy depending on the clinical syndrome. If there is kidney disease, there is mycophenolate. If there is arthritis, I will use methotrexate. But yes, I will use biological treatment, and there are many of them available and will show up next year as well, the FDA approved. We'll talk to you about this immune therapy. I want to go back to your question is, does lupus run to, through the utero, like during pregnancy? And the answer is, there are some antibodies, some proteins from lupus that are up. They are transmitted to the baby's heart and that will induce neonatal lupus. And therefore, I tell you, I will look at the pregnancy from time before pregnancy and at time of conceiving to the time when you are pregnant and will tell you what needs to be done to protect the baby and who are at risk and what we can do about it. Okay. Oh, there's a lot of information here. Can you have fibromyalgia without lupus or do they go hand in hand? One third of patients with lupus have chronic pain like fibromyalgia, and therefore it is there. If I say fibromyalgia, that's a word that's there. If we observe them, like I did a population study, we look at those fibromyalgia patients. Some of them, they will end up in rheumatoid arthritis, some will end up in lupus, and some may continue on fibromyalgia alone. And therefore, we have to work with the pain specialist dealing with fibromyalgia in lupus patients. Okay, this is great. What type of resources are provided by University of Maryland lupus physicians to help patients change their diet and track their symptoms? Yes, we have access to the uh, lupus foundation as well that have uh, information about it, but I'm happy to um, um, ask you to do that link as well on our website for during the month of lupus. Okay. I was diagnosed through a skin test with SLE about 15 years ago. I've been treated with Plaquenil. I have had very little joint pain, but numbness and tingling on my right side to include very cold bluish fingers. Since I'm not evidencing this general symptoms of lupus, should I be tested for perhaps another medical challenge? Well, you're lucky these days there are new skin lupus treatment uh, options. New ones are available specifically for skin disease. Those lupus, you have to think about it as an immune dysregulator, meaning there is something wrong in the immune system. It's oversensitive. And therefore, some may change from skin disease to spill over to other organs. Luckily, if you are not in have that, to happen to you with over like two or three years, then you have that weak gene. But yet, there are patterns that are involved in lupus, meaning the patient will show up only with skin disease or those come in with kidney disease or with um, brain disease. So those are the phases of lupus. So yes, you don't have to do testing to predict. At this time, there are no pure tests to predict. We are looking for those, including genetic testing, uh, but talking with your doctor about it and the lupus specialist may help you understand more about it. What I told you about skin of lupus, new medicine are there, 
yes, we think about lupus that will also intermix with the systemic disease. Having these changes in the hand may invite, may tell you that more than skin may be involved. All right, let me see if I can put these two questions together. Um, the first question is, what does the ANA pattern mean? And then here's another one that says, only having a positive ANA with a speckled pattern, but none of the other lupus blood tests comes back positive. What does this mean? Having a high ESR, a high C reactive protein, and low vitamin D along with other lupus symptoms. Can you meet the lupus criteria? We do not want you to use lupus criteria in your clinical setting. These criteria are made for research purposes. And therefore, I do not want the patient to say, do I have lupus or not based on this criteria? We tell this to students. We tell this to primary care doctors. However, if you have some symptoms that are look like lupus, some positive ANA, what we tell you, you have a ticket to your, the world of lupus, to the journey of lupus. Dealing with it is important. So if there is a high sedimentation rate and high C-reactive protein, that means there is something that is acting up over there. Talk to your doctor about it. They may need to do more testing, meaning like bone scan or others that can help get to that diagnosis. But also look for features that are hidden. I mean, we look for the urine, make sure there is no kidney disease. And then we will monitor the clinical syndrome as, as such and then see how things are moving around. But dealing with this discomfort or the vitamin D as a modulator to invite lupus, worsening of lupus is important. So dealing with pain, dealing with fatigue, dealing with these are challenges that we are, have not been able to um, accomplish at this phase in lupus. Okay, we have about six minutes. Let's see if we can speed through. My blood test was positive with one doctor and negative with another, and I've been treated for lupus for a few years now. How can I confirm if I really have lupus? My doctor, one doctor said I may be on the border. So a blood test does not tell us a lot about lupus. The clinical syndrome with the connection of the blood test will indicate lupus. There are clinical specific features of lupus. With the, with the specific blood test. What I said is having a positive blood test, it is, the, it is your ticket to the world of lupus. In rheumatoid arthritis, you may have a positive ANA. These blood tests we monitor over time. One time they may be positive, sometimes they may be negative. The lupus society have said, if you have a positive ANA at one point of time, I'm, I'm going to put you in a possibility of ending up in lupus. The key about it, what to do about it, how to deal with it. If there is kidney irritation, I'm going to make sure it does not get worse and I will treat um, that process through the kidney um, evaluation. Okay. I so repeating the blood test is helpful at times, but we do not want to hunt a positive blood test, a negative blood test. The key about it is your clinical symptoms at, is at, at, are at, at stake. Okay. I have discoid lupus and I've been on methotrexate for years. However, I don't like the side effects. Is there something else I should suggest or consider different therapies? There, is, there are new lupus medicine that targeting the skin. These are approved by the FDA over the past one year. So methotrexate and other tablets are available you need to talk to a lupus skin specialist that are available at University of Maryland, and they'll be happy to collaborate with us to work with you on that. Great. Can mononucleosis be a precursor or trigger for lupus? Any virus can induce lupus. There is a huge list of viruses. That relationship of viruses, bacteria, and fungus and lupus is huge. There is an interaction between viruses activation. We are not saying that lupus is an infectious disease. We're saying that these viruses trigger lupus. Now you mentioned about this ANA, the pattern. Does the pattern help us in anything? Again, it's depending on the technician who is doing that. There are certain patterns that can help narrow down 
what kind of lupus we're dealing with or what kind of immune disorder we are dealing with. The speckled pattern ANA are more associated with systemic sclerosis and connective tissue disease pattern. So repeating these tests and the titer with other tests may help narrow down the diagnosis. There's a patient here saying, I have frequent nausea and vomiting. Are these normal symptoms? Nowadays, we are aware of GI syndrome in lupus. We used to ignore it because we paid more attention to the kidney. These cyclic changes of nausea, vomiting are there, are reported in lupus, but we need the gastroenterologist to make sure there is no ulcer, there is no um, reflux disease, there is no pancreatitis that's there. And then when they say, I don't know what's happening, is there a possibility of lupus? Could be. So the key about it, we want to make sure that other elements are ruled out before we say it's lupus. Similarly, if a patient comes with a fever or fatigue, is it part of lupus? We tell you there is chronic fatigue syndrome, infectious diseases, uh, disorder, Lyme disease may come in with these features and may mimic lupus. And therefore, we want to make sure they are not there. More investigation is needed. Correct. All right. Last question here. My brother and sister both have lupus. They are both blood type A, and I don't blood type O positive. Does blood type play a role in lupus? The answer is no. But as I said, genetic testing are there, including those that lead to the type A um, um, phenotyping, genotyping. The key about it is the environmental factor, even having the gene, not only the blood type, but there are more other factors that are there that invite lupus. What I, I want to thank you for this opportunity dealing with this. Mm -hmm. Again, what we want is if you have questions, talk to your doctor about it. Send messages to the Lupus Foundation. There are many chats, if you look at it, that are there. You can reach out to the National Institute of Health use my name. They have access to that information and all your questions. We want awareness of lupus. That's our goal. In Baltimore, we have a high density of lupus. In young African-American women, we want to reach them. We measure the zip code. I told you the distance, how to reach there. We want to get a cab to bring you to the clinic. The key about it is get access be an advocate to your health, and that's what's important to prevent damage and prevent loss of kidney, but also because of new medication that are available. Dr. McDashi, I want to bring this Q&A to a close, and thank you for those comments right there. But I want to share what was said by one of the listeners, because I think it's perfect. It's many, many, many thanks to Dr. M for this webinar with an exclamation point. I really appreciate the way he speaks about both the medical side and his clients. Thank you so much for your work. I think that aptly says what so many of us are feeling after listening to you speak for this last short period of time. So I'm very grateful to you for doing it. Very thankful. This was terrific information. And obviously your passion around this topic is very clear and your passion for the well-being of your patients, very palpable. So. I thank you. Let me share a few last um, in pieces of information with our listeners. I did mention at the outset that this was being recorded and that you would be able to see the entire recording and these slides again in about 48 hours. The link is there, ums.org slash let's talk. You can see this one as well as you can look at any of the others who have um, gone here to Fort. It was two months ago that we did kidney disease and then autism was last month. So all of the topics that we've done month by month are listed there for you to see. Next month, which is June, will be the last in the series for right now. Uh, we don't do them during the summer. So June 21st will be Let's Talk About Health, and it's generally family fitness, family health and fitness as we head into the summer months. So thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, and Dr. McDashi, special, special thanks for your time, expertise, and caring and compassion. Everyone have a great afternoon. Thank you so much.